Good afternoon. I hope you had a good matchmaking session and that you were able to grab yourself some lunch and maybe also a coffee. What is the most beautiful technically elaborated product if the user does not see an added value? If the application of the product in his daily operations is troublesome or if it's simply difficult for him to make it work, he will not use it. What if the innovation does not make the life of the user easier, making his tasks maybe more cost efficient or making him faster or just help the single human being doing his job in a better way? Sometimes we are not paying enough attention to the user perspective because we are so overwhelmed by the richness of information that space data can provide us. How can we make sure that the users optimally be benefit from space data, that they can really easily use them and integrate them into their daily tasks? This is a key question if we want to make space-based products fly. My name is Susanne Katzler-Fuchs and I'm honored, honored to be the moderator of this ses session on space-based solutions for climate action. Where are the needs and what is the user perspective? I am CEO of PrimaTech, a market research company that bridges the gap between markets and technologies. We are doing this by putting potential users in the center of our work. We are involving them in an innovation project from the very beginning on. PrimaTech has also been official partner of the European Space Agency for more than 10 years now, being responsible for technology transfer. We do this by identifying space te technologies and looking for suitable applications for them on Earth. But enough from my side, let's go to our speakers. As three missions, we start our advisory report with a set of experts from four to eight experts from the space community and from the regional uh, and international disaster management communities. We uh, spend a week visiting different government agencies to understand what's the level of advancement regarding uh, the use of space technologies to address climate change. We often find out that it's the ministries of environment that seem to have the better capacities, the better skills to use space technologies. Disaster management agencies are sometimes falling uh, behind. We, of course, uh, have found it useful to keep uh, frequent communications with our national focal points. This we do either by emails or by chat. And in this way, we also find uh, what are the needs. And of course, when we carry out training activities, we talk to people and, and they make us aware of what would be uh, the needs. And of course, uh, when we organize conferences or expert meetings in, during discussion sessions, we also ask our target audience disaster management to make us aware of user needs. And uh, of course, there are many of us uh, in this effort of identifying user needs. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, some of the more general findings is that uh, while disaster management agencies may have specific needs, let's say we, we identified that ministries of environment come up with their own needs or ministries of agriculture or ministries of health or universities or geological and uh, volcanological or meteorological observatories, they may have different needs and they may use different types of satellite imagery for their purposes. So we cannot really come up with a one size uh, solution fits all. Uh, we have also found out that uh, in visiting different countries, we see that uh, some disaster management agencies in some countries are more advanced than others when it comes to using space technologies and space-based information. In some countries like Nigeria, South Africa, Peru, Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, India, we find that the, there are space agencies that are contributing already to address those needs. And so there are questions to us maybe a little bit different that we have to try to find out how to work with those space agencies to fulfill the needs of national disaster management agencies. So in general, I would say we don't really have a one size fits all solution, but it's, it's more uh, tailoring the solutions to the individual 
cases of countries. Every now and then we do try to do some regional efforts. If you could pass to the next slide, please. Uh, regarding climate change, uh, from the point of view of disaster management agencies, climate change is not really introducing any new hazards that they may not be looking at. Uh, what I'm saying here is disaster management agencies have been confronting floods, droughts, forest fires, heat waves, severe weather, hurricanes, tropical storms, winter storms, tornadoes, typhoons, cyclones, landslides, and others. They have already approached this. But what climate change is bringing is, of course, more frequent and more intense events. You may remember back in 2019, two cyclones back to back hitting Mozambique and other countries in Southern Africa uh, within a period of a couple of weeks. Uh, this happened also at the end of last year here in Central America where two hurricanes in a very extended hurricane season impacted Central American countries, uh, triggering a variety of disasters. Uh, the, the experience from Central America is interesting because on average, there used to be about 13 hurricanes. If, if you look at the uh, annual statistics of hurricanes in, in the Caribbean, it used to be about, on average, 13 to 14 hurricanes. But already in the year 2005, uh, and, and they usually name hurricanes, uh, they, they give specific names to hurricanes from A to Z. Already in 2005, they had to jump to uh, the uh, Greek alphabet because they, they went past uh, Hurricane Z. I remember Hurricane Wilma was a very severe one impacting Yucatan in Mexico. Uh, back in 2020, the same thing happened. Uh, they had more than 27 uh, uh, tropical storms with the, with the uh, typical alphabet and the, uh, the two hurricanes that impacted Central America were Eta and Yota. So this gives you an idea of the increasing frequency of events and the magnitudes of course or, or intensities are more severe. So, but they, they are addressing these challenges and I think that one of the key issues is they look at exposure and how that, how that exposure is changing when it comes to more severe events that have a larger geographical span. Uh, but except for probably sea level rise that may impact storm surges, for them, uh, climate change is not really bringing any new hazards that they are not aware of. The next slide, please. Uh, specific user needs that we find when, when doing missions and we're talking to people, of course, some of the things they are not aware of new products, new developments. And of course, one of the, the key needs they, they raise aware about is what new tools could they use that may have been developed by the space community to address some of these challenges. They, of course, request that we increase the, the skills of their staff. And uh, that we do through training courses uh, uh, to address uh, new types of satellite imagery or new products or new services. Uh, one of the, uh, let's say, game changers that we see in uh, recent years is the more the capacity to access the, the Sentinel imagery, including radar imagery that was not really available before the Sentinels to map the extent of floods. So this is something that they have a lot of interest on. Of course, in some cases, uh, they may come across uh, donations of particular types of satellite imagery that they may not be aware of. Let's say in Central America, they, they may not be aware of how to process satellite imagery from satellites either from Korea or from China or from Russia. So they are interested in knowing what type of software would they need to use to process such satellite imagery. And in some cases, uh, they are aware of higher resolutions of that imagery. And of course, in selected cases, they ask us if we can facilitate access to specific types of satellite imagery, whether it's higher resolution optical imagery or higher resolution radar imagery. These are some of the typical user needs that we come across from countries in Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And so we try to fulfill these needs. Uh, can I ask for the next slide, please? 
So how do we respond to these needs? Of course, uh, we carry out uh, workshops, conferences, expert meetings, and um, in our missions, we raise awareness about new products, services, and applications developed by the space community. We, of course, carry out uh, with our regional partners, our regional support offices, we develop step-by-step -step procedures using open software to process satellite imagery to generate specific types of maps. We are encouraging very much the use, the combined use of archived and up-to-date imagery. This is something that they, they haven't really thought about. And uh, if there is something that the space community has, is a fantastic archive of satellite imagery. In the context of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction 2015-2030, there is one of four uh, priority areas that is called understanding risk. And this Sendai framework, which has been signed by 187 countries to address challenges posed by hazards, they recognize that there is a need to understand how risks are growing, increasing, and the use of satellite imagery helps us track how this process has been going on in the last decades. And so the use of uh, the combined use of archived and up-to-date imagery is something that, they, that we're encouraging very much for uh, national disaster management agencies and other stakeholders to understand uh, that it's not only climate change that is impacting uh, disasters, but also improper development trends, whether it's uh, inadequate land use uh, changes or inadequate building codes and so on that may be leading to worse uh, disasters. So it's not only climate change, but also inadequate frameworks of development. And so we, we encourage the use of uh, this archived and up-to-date imagery. We also encourage very much the use of satellite imagery of different resolutions. Uh, uh, at the national level, of course, we encourage ministries to use some resolution at the, and at the more local level, at the municipal level, we encourage the use of higher resolution. So we also encourage this combined use of satellite imagery in different resolution. And we, of course, carry out additional capacity building efforts. We find that it's important to address the directors of disaster management agencies. Uh, one of the things that you find in developing countries is that usually after an electoral process, there may be changes in the directors of these institutions. So we have to raise awareness with the new directors regarding the benefits of uh, space technologies, because they may not be aware of that. So if we want to enhance the continuity of our efforts, we have to do this continuous capacity building effort at that senior le leadership level of directors of disaster management agencies so that they can continue the efforts, they can sustain the effort to institutionalize the use of space-based information and disaster management, which is basically our aim. In many countries, uh, the use of geographic information systems is already fairly well institutionalized. So with UN Spider, what we're aiming is to institutionalize the use of space-based information and space-based technologies. And, and I took note of the comments of Suzanne very much. I think that one of the issues that we have to be aware of is that of course, uh, there are many solutions coming from the developed community, from, uh, from uh, international organizations and space agencies, and, and there's a limit to how much they can use all of these new solutions. Uh, we, we have to understand that we cannot come every year with a new solution and expect them to change everything to adapt to that new solution. So you, you also have to keep in mind uh, that we cannot really bombard them with so many new solutions at one point every year. So these are the comments. Uh, can I have the last slide? And uh, with these comments, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and all of you for your attention. And I stand by for any questions. And I uh, thank my colleagues in Vienna for helping me with the uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan, for this really interesting presentation. I think there were a lot of new insights in that uh, speech, at least for me. Um, if the audience has any questions for Juan, please write it in the chat. 
um, and we will uh, um, have the common Q and A session at the end uh, of this uh, session. Okay, so let's go to our next speaker. It's Joanna Post. I already see you, Joanna. Hello. <laughs> we are very happy to have you today. Um, Joanna Post is Program Management Officer at the Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and currently Acting Manager of the Collective Progress Subdivision. She leads support for negotiations and exchange at the Science Policy Interface and the global stock take of the Paris Agreement. She also leads support for ocean-related activities and engagement at the Secretariat. Prior to joining it, um, Dr. Post has led a career working in science communications. She holds a PhD in environmental science from the University of Newcastle upon time from the UK. Joanna, I'm really happy to have you in this session today. And uh, let me also state that uh, having had a career as a science communication expert is uh, extremely exciting also for me. So I'm really looking forward uh, to your uh, presentation on how Earth ob observation can support climate action under the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to you and Uso and everyone here for inviting me to speak. I just wanted to check that you can see my slides and hear me okay. Yes, we can see your slides and we hear you well. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the user perspective. Um, we are at the UNFCCC Secretariat, uh, not an implementing agency, but an agency that supports the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. And I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, the user perspective from, from our point of view at the very least, uh, particularly in regards to climate change. Um, we have, uh, I, I say this in many of my presentations and I will say it here, observations are absolutely the foundation for commitments and decision making on climate change. We, if uh, there was no observation, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. So um, it's really important as the foundation for all the decision making on climate change. It is a value chain approach that we consider here. So the observations, the foundation, the research is extremely important. The IPCC is a very valuable input also to the UNFCCC process as they assess all of the scientific literature. And all of that information feeds into um, what parties uh, do in terms of their implementation at national level, but it also feeds into what happens in the process itself. Um, and there are several uh, process elements that I'd like to speak to also um, in this presentation. But really, that whole value chain is extremely important. Climate services, on top of that, is becoming increasingly important as well for, for national level action, regional level action, and so on. But on the UNFCCC side, of course, that information feeds in, and then there is messaging back from the UNFCCC, from the parties and the governments, back to the scientific community on, on directions and needs and so on and so forth. And of course, many of you will have heard that uh, we've recently come back from Glasgow, uh, and there's a Glasgow Climate Pact was uh, one of the many decisions uh, resulting from those negotiations in Glasgow. The uh, mandate on research systematic observation uh, is founded in the UNFCCC Paris Agreement, uh, sorry, in the UNFCCC Convention. The Paris Agreement, of course, was the point at which science uh, fell into the policy making process, but then there was a paradigm shift and the policy making process then dictated the ways forward. And this really has changed how science and scientists should consider their interaction now moving forward. And there's a real need to, to respond very much to the needs of the climate change uh, community in providing the right information that's needed for decision making on climate change. So, so the Paris Agreement, of course, is the, is the legally bounding treaty under the UNFCCC uh, decided in 2015. The, it started in 2020. There are national targets, nationally determined contributions. So every single party provides information of which they will uh, will pursue in terms of mitigation reduction. And there's also national adaptation communications to look at the adaptation um, responses. So that is a communication of information. Of course, the action then needs to happen. Parties will then report on, on their actions through the enhanced transparency framework. A process called the global stock tech. This is a process again under, under the convention. We'll look at, at, at where, where we are in, on, a, on a globally aggregated level. 
And that will lead then in, um, the first global stock take started now will take place over the next two years. And in 2025, there will be a push then for revised nationally determined contributions, higher ambition, and the cycle continues. And of course, the basis of that needs to be uh, a determination to limit global temperatures to 1.5 degrees, to adapt and foster resilience, to, to have low GHG development pathways, and to provide the finance needed in that context. So, Earth observation uh, for Paris implementation, I've tried to pull out some of the key points um, in my slides. Of course, there's always so much more detail than I can go into in, the, in these short 10, 15 minutes. But uh, in terms of Earth observation, uh, we coordinate, of course, with a, a lot of uh, colleagues in the community, um, GCOS, WMO, um, the CIOS, CGMS Working Group on Climate, GEO, and, and, and others. And what's needed is really to understand the climate system and what's needed to support action on climate change. So that's the information that needs to be sort of pulled out. Um, and it needs to be a, a continuation to provide that information at the same time as identifying needs, gaps, and support sustained observations of the climate, particularly in, in areas where there's, there's limited coverage that needs to be strengthened, as well as supporting access to data, to climate service, and so on. So there's an importance, of course, for Earth observation, for, for um, having long-term data records, including essential climate variables, providing the right indicators on, on where we are with climate change to provide services for decision-making. And this uh, needs to be constantly looked at in terms of scaling up at regional, at national, at subnational level, uh, coordinating with regional centers, looking at um, emissions, uh, emissions reductions, climate services, um, information about weather and climate, including downscaling and reanalysis, supporting data exchange and planning and so on. So in terms of mitigation, um, the push, of course, now is, is uh, coming out of Glasgow, particularly as well as an, a facilitation of a transition to, to the objective of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. So what does that mean? It means supporting long-term GHG emission reduction strategies, as well as short-term mitigation action. Um, the integrated greenhouse gas information system, for example, of WMO is trying to bring the information from, from all sorts of observation, including Earth observation together to support um, certain projects. There's uh, work going on in the satellite community. I'm sure many of you know about bringing information to, to, to look at GHG mitigation, and that needs to be done in a context of how to help uh, countries reduce their, reduce their emissions. And there are um, a number of activities that can be supported, including estimating emissions uh, in cities, identifying opportunities for reductions, um, estimating emissions of specific sectors and, and opportunities for reduction there. We know, for example, there's a lot of work now going on in terms of identifying and reducing methane emissions. Uh, and then, uh, so there's the action side, and of course there's the monitoring, reporting, verification by parties on greenhouse gas, um, uh, greenhouse gases. So that will come under the Paris Agreement through a, a transparent framework, it's called the transparency framework. There's a number of reports that are already ongoing, but these will be uh, streamlined, if you like, into transparency reports that will be uh, provided for the first time by parties in 2024. Uh, the Paris Agreement has brought this uh, this uh, requirement from uh, that was previously different for, for developed and developing countries now into a unified approach under the Paris Agreement. Um, there's a need moving forward, and I think the, the Earth Observation Community has a big role to play in, in providing information around uh, GHG emissions and supporting uh, monitoring, reporting, verification, to look at how to reduce uh, other certainties. And there's already projects going on looking at uh, matching what observations are saying compared to what statistics agencies and, and reporting agencies are providing at the national level. And I think there's an opportunity there to, to really um, uh, mobilize uh, communication to, to support uh, countries to, to provide their um, national inventories, as well as provide um, support to developing country parties that, that uh, are really just starting on this road that Kyoto um, countries have, have, have been down quite, for quite a long time now. So, um, assisting countries reducing uncertainties um, to provide accurate GHG inventories is important, and looking at long uh, low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. And coming out of Glasgow, actually, there's now been set up a work program to urgently look at how to scale up mitigation and ambition and implementation under the, under the Paris Agreement. 
Moving to adaptation, uh, one of the main uh, uh, directions that, or main um, modalities under the UNFCCC is, is what's called the NAP process, the National Adaptation Plan process. This was set up in Cancun. Um, and this was really uh, supporting developing country parties to, to address adaptation needs, to reduce vulnerability, build adaptive capacity, facilitate integration of climate change adaptation in a coherent manner into policy making. And then from Paris, there was the global goal for adaptation was part of Article 7 of the Paris Agreement, enhancing adaptive capacity, strengthening resilience, reducing vulnerability. So the adaptation goal under the Paris Agreement is a key goal um, in that regards. Um, just touching very briefly here on, um, on national adaptation plans, it's, it's a complicated diagram, but it's also important to recognize the, the need for a systems approach um, in addressing adaptation needs at the country level to look at what are, um, countries in, in their national adaptation plans, there's a, there's a series of steps they go through to provide them. There's a support provided by the, the um, GCF. And countries really bring together the, the a basis of information, so they're the databases that, that's, that's provided and identify their priorities. And, and this is done with, through a, a, a sort of NAP SDGI frame by, by the NAP team to really look at, at, uh, at what the priority needs are, as well as look at what the projects are moving forward. Um, and this is a very organic process, but of course it has to bring in a, large range of data and information to, to move it move it along. So Earth observations needed for adaptation, if you like that, that colorful diagram to, to decide what needs to be do, done, but it also needs to be provided on adaptation because under the Paris Agreement, we need to look at progress on adaptation. That's part of the adaptation goal. So Earth observation could provide a lot of help in that regards. You know, adaptation is very complicated. It's a very local specific um, uh, requirement, but at the same time, what can the baseline be to establish exposure to, to climate impact drivers in past years? So how do we measure adaptation moving forward now that the Paris Agreement has started? What are the trends over time? Um, how can we improve the assessment of risk, both before and after extreme events, as uh, Juan Carlos was, was talking about? Um, and then look at sort of decision support, um, support active decision making. So of course, uh, countries need need to have their adaptation plans, but they also need information, early warning systems, crop monitors, and so on and so forth, um, help countries to move uh, transition. And I think Earth Observation has a huge role to play in, in providing the right information to, to, to move forward on adaptation, as well as provide the capacity development and the understanding of the importance of Earth Observation for this, this decision making. Uh, and actually, um, so there's a, there's a point to, to track adaptation, so to provide information on adaptation, to track it over time. And actually the global goal and adaptation and work program uh, was set up in Glasgow for this as well, to, to, to look at how, how really to, to pursue um, and identify what this uh, goal is and, and how to support um, measurement of it moving forward. Um, my last uh, main point in, in, in this uh, short presentation is, is the global stop tick, which is the, a, a process part of the Paris Agreement, but an extremely important one. It's the ratchet mechanism of the Paris Agreement. It really gives the opportunity to stop and say, right, where are we with climate change globally and what needs to what needs to be done? Where are the, the, the good examples and, and, and how are we addressing long term goals? And, and there is the, the, the praise to in the Paris Agreement, the parties will uh, shall um, in, increase ambition every five year cycle. So the Paris Agreement Article 14, the global stock take is, is a taking stock of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, assessing collective progress towards achieving its purpose and long term goals. As I mentioned, it's just start and it'll, it'll, it's a process that will take place over the next two years. It looks at three key themes, mitigation, adaptation, finance flows and means of implementation and support. It has a cross cutting um, aspect to it has to be based on equity on the best available science and actually when the modalities for the Paris Agreement were, um, were set up in Katowice added to that um, uh, themes were the issues around uh, response measures so certain economic consequences impacts of response measures um, as well as looking at the loss and damage the risk, risk part of it as well so it's going to be a very intense two years of stop taking 
Um, it has a, as I mentioned, modalities, which were set up in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in Katowice. So at the minute, there's an information collection and preparation phase. Um, everyone is invited to, to provide information, of, of aggregated information of where we are. Um, to, to, they will, that will lead into a technical assessment um, with a series of technical dialogues. And at the end of 2023 at COP27, um, sorry, 28, <laughs> apologies, there will be high level messaging to look at pushing ambition moving forward. So, in regards to the, the Earth observation to support the global stock take, um, again, it's a need to provide information and input to the, the themes of the global stock take. Uh, for mitigation, for example, that's looking at greenhouse gas emissions, temperature trends and projections. What is the support to parties for their, for their monitoring and reporting? What can be done in the future? Um, looking at adaptation, observed projected impacts and information around indicators. How is the observation community can support the measurement of indicators and the measurement of collective progress over time? What support is being provided to the developing countries? Um, where we are in terms of um, in terms of uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, so one of the things that uh, I'm working with, with with colleagues, or really we, we initiated with colleagues in the Earth Observation Community last year that's, that's ongoing, is, is a group of, uh, of, of colleagues in the Observation Community to provide some of this input in a synthesis report into the global stock take, um, really to look at how party level can improve accuracy, detail, identification of, of what is happening, how many people are, are using Earth observations to support implementation of the Paris Agreement, where can we go in the future um, at, at both the national and, at, and aggregated level. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of end by saying that I think um, it's, it's really a quite an exciting time for the Earth observation support of the, of the Paris Agreement. I think we're at the very, very beginning of how we can better integrate the, the information that's provided from the Earth Observation Community into the decision making that's needed to implement uh, both mitigation and adaptation action and to measure progress over time. Um, and I think there's a, a lot, a lot that, that needs to be looked at um, in terms of uh, consistency and, and, and providing that information in a, in a useful and usable way. But um, I think there's a, there's a very exciting time to, to be engaging with you. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me and I pass the floor back now to, uh, to my colleagues. Thank you, Joanna, for your inspiring talk. Um, I would like to add one observation that we make here. I think based on, on this wonderful work that you are doing, we are seeing a lot of uh, startups popping up using Earth observation data and other space-based data um, that relate to climate change services, for example, for soil moisture monitoring or the monitoring of the quality of air or crop management. And I think this is really super because they can then bring this into the broad uh, community and then in the society as a whole and, yeah, and make space-based data really a success. So thank you very much, Joanna. Um, Thank you. If anyone has questions to Joanna, I just saw that a link has been posted uh, in the um, chat where you can post your questions uh, and we will answer them in the common Q&A section uh, at the end of this session. Thank you, Joanna. And then I would like to come to our next uh, presenter. Uh, I'm happy to have uh, Annalisa Donati. Annalisa is currently Secretary General at URISI, the European Association of Space Agencies, mandated to bridge the gap between space and society. Um, as research fellow at the European Space Policy Institute, ESPI, here in Vienna, and previously with the European Space Agency, Industrial Policy and SME Division, she was responsible, responsible for the studies on space economy, finance and innovation, as well as for development of policies related to these domains. Um, Annalisa will give uh, her speech about space opportunities for climate changes, how space solutions power the green transition. I'm curious to hear that. Um, and uh, thank you, Annalisa, for your speech.
thank you very much, Susanne. I hope everybody can hear me uh, properly and can see the presentation. We can see your presentation and we hear you well. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like uh, to first thank all the organizers for this uh, very interesting uh, event and for having me today to present uh, this, which was one of the uh, very successful uh, initiatives that we've been uh, developing last year together with our partner organization, Grand Session Space. Um, and um, well, I mean, uh, I am. Uh, Really like uh, delighted to be in uh, such a panel with uh, all uh, great previous uh, speakers. And well, without any further delay, I will uh, start with my presentation. So uh, here we go. For I will start by introducing a little bit Urizi for all uh, those who do not know us. Uh, Urizi is a non for profit association of uh, space agencies and governmental offices of. Uh, uh, space affairs uh, across Europe and beyond. So here you can uh, see a little bit of a map uh, of uh, our members currently supporting our activities. And uh, Eurizi has been funded back in uh, 1989 uh, with the, at the time visionary mission of bridging the gap between space and society. And uh, basically Eurizi is um, championing user needs. So what we do, it's really like we bring users on the spotlight. We ask them what, uh, uh, what are their needs and their challenges uh, in their sector. And we try to bring them closer to the, uh, to the space community to try to understand where a satellite based application can support their needs and can uh, help them uh, tackling their challenges. So, indeed, our approach is composed, uh, let's say, on uh, three uh, major stream of activities. The first one being the awareness raising campaigns that we're always doing. And um, this is uh, just uh, an, an action to um, uh, spread the voice on the benefits of satellite based application for society. And uh, we do though. We do that uh, very often by building the platforms where uh, users and uh, and the space community can uh, can share their their experiences, can um, can talk, and can uh, find partners, investors, and uh, projects that they can develop together. In this sense, we are also a matchmaker because, indeed, while doing so, of course, we bring together different interests from different partners, and uh, we try to match them and we do work also as an advisor in the sense that uh, having uh, such a privileged view on the user's needs and on the challenges and bottlenecks that uh, very often uh, users are experiences are experiencing their uptake of satellite based application what we do is that we bring back the feedback to decision makers in order to smooth the path for the integration of satellite based uh, solution um, in this sense, uh, we might uh, we might ask ourselves uh, why space application. So space application are key because we are meeting today in a, in a time of immense challenges for sustainable development. So natural resource depletion, uh, adverse impact of environmental degradation, including uh, desertification, drought, land degradation, freshwater scarcity loss of biodiversity exacerbate all the least that uh, of challenges that you humanity is facing right now climate change is most definitely one of the greatest challenges of our time and uh, its uh, adverse impacts undermine the ability of all countries to achieve sustainable development so to address the challenges and in this i cannot but agree more with what uh, joanna was saying before we need to develop an integral holistic approach that takes into account all the different sources uh, um, of information that uh, can provide the decision maker with actionable information to um, direct uh, mitigation actions and also to uh, larger let's say um, uh, strategy for adaptation and uh, by definition, satellite data are objective, shareable, and scalable, and they need to be integrated into the sources of information that uh, we can use. So, in this sense, again, uh, space system ranging from meteorological to telecommunication, from navigation to earth observation, proved to be an effective tool to measure and monitor climate change, and most importantly, needs to help mitigate the consequences, reducing the uncertainties surrounding the future projection on the resources management 
uh, at national, local, uh, regional, international level. And uh, what you can see here are basically the essential climate variable that I believe that for Yuan and uh, everybody else here, it's um, uh, something that they, they found quite uh, uh, understandable. And uh, half of those climate variables, which has been defined by the UN FCCC, um, being them atmospheric, oceanic, terrestrial, can be measured through satellite information. So satellites um, are helpful in more than half uh, of the identified essential climate variables. Uh, notwithstanding this uh, fact, um, satellites. Uh, data satellite technology are still considered more technology demonstrators rather than components of a critical communication and information based infrastructure and uh, which can be used and which can be uh, action to actually provide op optimize let's say the decision making processes in our modern societies and um, there is thus a missing link between the infrastructure which is already there and uh, the, uh, basically, uh, uh, which is operative and uh, which is gathering on a daily basis a tetrabyte of information and uh, that could actually use to make and to take well informed fact decisions. So I can see myself frozen. So I'm wondering if you can still hear me properly. Uh, we can still hear you properly, but your video is uh, not working anymore. Okay, so I guess that you are not uh, also seeing we can the presentation. See your okay, it's that's just slide. It's just your video. Okay, that's great. Uh, no problem. So indeed, uh, um, oh, maybe I can do also something else. Maybe I can stop my video. Well, anyways, so. Um, uh, in all of this, uh, I wanted to say that here comes up the EURESI and uh, last year, following the strategic direction drawn by our members, we decided to start the Space for Environment initiative. So, in line with the traditional value proposition of the association, which is based on the collection of user cases, we have been starting mapping relevant stakeholders at European level with the objective to identify user needs and challenges, supporting their interaction with suitable service providers. And um, we've been working to promote operational satellite based solution. And I would like to highlight uh, operational um, uh, to address uh, specific needs. Uh, of the related communities and uh, and eventually we do work on the development of policy recommendation which uh, stimulate a wider uptake of the solutions so in this uh, in this light we started last year as i mentioned the space opportunities for climate challenges uh, webinar series which uh, was uh, basically meant to offer a one stop shop networking networking platform to gather interested stakeholders to find relevant information, news, events, calls, uh, for funding calls, partners and uh, customers for space applications related to climate. So we. Um, Annalisa, your. Your slides are not uh, visible anymore. Hey, Maybe also. If Annalisa has. Connection. She's not anymore in the pan panelists list. Um, okay. We need to improvise a bit now, um, and maybe we need to move on and ask Annalisa to come back as soon as she's online. And I see already uh, being ready to jump in now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, I guess um, let's let's do as suggested. Um, let's have maybe Annalisa uh, with the second part of her talk at the uh, end of the session. Um, yes, it's not it's not Christmas yet, but we have a Christmas to now. I was told. Um, so Reina uh, Otsuka and Bertrand Frod will be uh, jointly presenting um, the next uh, presentation. Reina is a digital innovation specialist and nat for nature, climate and energy, and she is the digital um, innovation specialist leading digital transformation in the nature, climate and energy portfolio of UNDP. Uh, prior to that uh, role, she served as an environmental specialist and regional innovation lead in Rwanda country office, joining UNDP after a career in the private sector. 
Um, and uh, her co-speaker, Bertrand, I think it's Bertrand or Bertrand, I don't know, <laughs> Bertrand. <laughs> Um, Bertrand has joined the United Nations Development Program eight years ago after a career in the private sector at Exxon, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and IBM. Uh, he is today a uh, deputy CIO and has promoted the use of satellite technologies at UNDP since the end of 2015. Uh, together, David will give us a presentation about uh, graphical information systems being the future of development. So I'm in on your presentation and I hope uh, that everything works now. Yeah, so uh, we'll see. And then if we, if we cut, but Annalisa will come back and then we'll come back after. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> voilà, so, uh, but we are very glad to, uh, to, to represent uh, UNDP today. So UNDP, it's the United Nations uh, Development Program. Uh, so we are one of the UN agencies. We are the one in charge of uh, development and rule of law. Uh, development it includes now uh, economic development and also uh, and also environment development on the impact of uh, climate change. So I don't know, Marcus and Tim, if you can put the the presentation online. And uh, thank you. And we are great users of. Uh, well, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So we are great users of uh, of satellite imagery, and and more and more, and uh, it's growing every year, and, and now it's reaching all our country offices. Voilà. We are a highly decentralized organization. We have uh, 170 country offices, and now almost all are using uh, these technologies on various cases. And so, uh, for local analysis, to monitor our projects, uh, to monitor the impact of uh, climate change, to monitor on analyze poverty for disaster recovery, to, uh, to, to monitor reconstructions. And uh, so it's really a, a standard tool now. Uh, and we are training more than uh, 200 practitioners to use these, uh, these technologies per year. And also uh, we use them a lot to complement our local data. So uh, it's so widespread that it's now uh, being uh, embedded into our uh, flagship reports. Uh, the, 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 the most uh, famous one being the Human Development Report that we publish uh, every year, which now uh, has analysis uh, using the satellite imagery and uh, GIS uh, and GIS. Voilà. And uh, there is no nobody is better than uh, than Heina to explain you uh, in detail how we use the, these technologies into our development projects. Thank you, Bertrand. Uh, if you can switch to the next slide. And uh, so this will not be a technical presentation. We will try to um, try to introduce how how satellite imagery really integrates into all the work that we're doing. And it, there's a lot of questions as well that we would love to discuss with this the the great participants here today, and also the the fellow panelists. So just to give you a bit of context, and then I will try to introduce uh, a few trends that we're seeing uh, based on some examples. Um, the context here is that the UNDP's nature, climate, and energy portfolio actually covers around 750 projects in more than 140 countries. And uh, this is the ones that, these are just projects that the headquarter is directly involved in. Um, as Bertrand was saying, we're a highly decentralized organization. So there's a lot more that is actually happening on the ground, which don't uh, show up in this in this data. And uh, we cover from uh, climate change mitigation, uh, meaning sustainable energy and forestry, uh, and then also climate change uh, adaptation. We also cover environment and biodiversity, uh, pollution and waste management, um, as well as food and agriculture. So it is a pretty wide set of um, thematic areas that we, we are operational in. And for all of these projects, most of them, of course, includes policy work, but there's also a lot of ground um, implementation, such as if you speak about reforestation, we, we could go uh, to uh, reforestation itself. Uh, it could also be capacity building of uh, the government. Uh, there is really a wide range of uh, activities that are happening on the ground. Next slide, please. Um, and also, I just wanted to um, introduce, oops, one of the photos are gone. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to introduce that we are on a journey for digital transformation. 
And UNDP embarked on a digital transformation journey from a digital strategy back in 2019. And our team, the Nature Climate Energy team, has been at the forefront of this uh, implementation. And what it means in, in our context is we are looking at three strategic pathways, which is data innovation and then inclusivity and safeguard. So for data, basically, um, you know, of course, we've always been trying to use data to the best extent possible. Um, but again, coming with all of these new digital technologies and new ways of collecting data coming in, now we're really forced to switch our ways of thinking to, to really use real-time data, to use satellite imagery, geospatial data, um, really new ways of collecting information and designing intervention. So that is one big opportunity that, that we are seeing in this digital uh, age. The second is innovation. Uh, we really want to um, create an innovation ecosystem in the local context. So when we speak about innovation, it will be really about a mixture of how can we work and partner with uh, big global technology providers, as well as how can we nurture together um, some te the technology innovation ecosystem in, in each country. And so that, that whatever that comes out will actually benefit uh, the local economy as well. And finally, inclusivity and safeguard, we are seeing that digital technologies are definitely something that, um, that, that contributes to sustainable development and especially in these environmental fields. Uh, but at the same time, we also have to be mindful that digital technologies can also have some drawbacks and negative impact. So we are trying to think of ways to promote uh, how, how environmental sustainability can be and also inclusivity, you know, how can we actually ensure that gender is considered? Uh, the people who are the leave no one behind principle, we say in the UN, how can we ensure that technology also follows this principle? Uh, that is something that we're trying to promote as well as uh, think through in the next few years. And uh, with all of these combined, we do want to contribute toward the, the next strategic plan that was just published. Uh, toward a structural transformation for a green, inclusive, and digital transition of societies. Next slide, please. There's an animation. <laughs> so, um, sorry, the, the slide is a little bit clunky, but I do want to introduce four trends or needs that we are seeing across the portfolio um, with some examples. The first trend is that it, it is really important that it is um, the capacity is built for a sustainable application of whatever um, geospatial or satellite imagery based analysis or interventions that we do. The two examples that I am showing here is, um, I think you can probably figure out <laughs> already without me explaining, but one is in Vietnam where we, we did a climate risk assessment of, you know, overlaying uh, the, the climate risk with uh, the rural infrastructure to figure out which rural infrastructure needs uh, to be strengthened uh, and where are the vulnerable communities so that we can actually start to design some interventions in climate change adaptation. The one on the, the right is basically similar, but again, it was used for uh, designing a project where we want to provide wetland uh, restoration as well as livelihood uh, opportunities around the wetland. Uh, to, I think it contributed to uh, 4, 4 million, 40,000 40, 40, people. This project, again, um, you know, it used satellite imagery to actually think through of this uh, intervention. But again, we are seeing that, you know, after we provide these uh, services or, or some kind of technical assistance to these uh, initial data analysis, how can actually how can this be carried on instead of just providing a report and um, and handing it over? How can we actually build the local uh, capacity or or the government capacity in order to carry out similar assessments toward the future? That is one thing that is really much in need, and I think this community might be able to um, come in and uh, also start to partner around. The next slide, please. The second trend we are seeing that it is actually being a new a part of new value creation. So instead of thinking of satellite imagery as a standalone um, and using it for data analytics, we are seeing more and more projects are starting to use it as part of a new value creation. 
So the two examples here uh, happen to be both from the food and agriculture commodity system uh, area. The, for example, in Peru, they are trying to use satellite imagery combined with the drone and other types of indicators that they can collect on the field to, to come up with a, um, a repository of data so that impact investors can come in and, and check you know, which farms are, are actually um, deforestation free and how can they actually you know, invest in these farming uh, activities. So you can see that it's not just you know, used for data analytics, but it's, it's really integrated as part of a data platform or a part of some kind of service that's, that's being provided on the ground. The one on the left is in Indonesia where similarly they're doing a satellite monitoring uh, partnering with, an, with academia, but basically they, they're providing alerts on when there's some kind of deforestation activities happening. It just provides real time alerts so that commodity, uh, the, the people in the value chain can actually go and check and see if their commodity is, is again, um, free from, from deforestation or any kind of negative activities. So that kind of um, mindset is really key, key in, in the portfolio now. Uh, the next slide, please. The third is uh, slightly similar, but um, I just wanted to reiterate on, I think uh, it was uh, Joanna who mentioned that, you know, we need to take a system approach. A, a lot of these problems need a system approach and it's also, you know, how can we catalyze new ways of uh, models of intervention and uh, the payment for environmental service system or the red plus uh, in forestation uh, projects. These are really good examples of where satellite imagery actually catalyzed new ways of financing. And for example, you can see on this screen that um, it's in it's in Portuguese. But so it, it's a it's a set of um, activities that need to happen, which starts from you know identifying where the farmers or the indigenous communities are to actually that that can actually contribute to forest management or sustainable forest management through their daily livelihood activities. And then, of course, you know, that involves um, looking at the satellite imagery and identifying where are their borders of the farming or land. Uh, and then it goes into, you know, collecting other types of metadata like their income or what their commodity is, uh, what are going their um, committed activities, those uh, other metadata needs to be collected uh, in places where there's, you know, basically no, no internet connection, for example. And then those have to be in one data database. It has to be connected to some kind of payment uh, system and monitoring has to happen in order to make sure that these payments are uh, going to the right people. Um, and then of course, you know, as an aggregate, we do have to go through this whole thing. Um, and, and have a final report on, on how much um, forest has actually been managed and uh, service has been provided. So again, like the, the satellite imagery and digital technologies is actually catalyzing these new types of intervention that were not possible before. So it's really about trying to find uh, how we can use it, not just for analysis, but for, for these types of different um, business processes. The next slide, please. Um, and finally, we do see a lot of needs on moving from bespoke analytics to scale. I must say UNDP has been using satellite imagery for quite a while at the project level or at one site level, but we are, we are trying to find ways of scaling uh, globally. And this is always a, a, a trade-off because, you know, for example, we did a poverty, um, poverty prediction analysis, and we tried to apply it across different countries, but tropical forests are uh, associated with poverty in some countries, whereas in other countries it's associated with uh, rich richness. So that, that kind of algorithms difference is really difficult to make it into something global, but we do see this as a good challenge and we want to really move into scaling all of these, um, these opportunities. Uh, the example I have here is is a exploration work where we try to identify where the population without electricity are residing, because UNDP just uh, launched an energy hub where we're uh, we're really aiming to um, bring access to electricity to 500 million people in the next uh, few years and four years, 
and it has to start from where are these people? And this is a combination of nightlight imagery and also uh, applying machine learning in order to, um, you know, take out all of the variables and find where potentially these people who are living but without electricity are living. And so we are in partnership with academia, of course, but this kind of new ways of um, filling in data gaps is really needed, and I, I, it, it is a long-term research, I believe. Um, it cannot, it, it is always a trade-off between, you know, can we do something quickly, but then it's not really ground-proofed. So it, it will be great if we can, you know, start to discuss how this can be more systematically done. Next slide, please. Oh. So, Again, partnership is really key to all of these. I see Annalisa it actually returned. Um, I was actually thinking, you know, Annalisa, your work at the CRC is great. We do really want to partner with uh, with organizations like Annalisa, um, Annalisa's. And basically for all of these trends, you can see that there's a, it's all about open data and open source um, innovation ecosystems. Uh, how can we nurture the local innovation ecosystem? That's really key. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we also have to start thinking of new ways of designing. It needs to be value-based design, human-centered design, and it has to be multidisciplinary in order ta to tackle all of these systemic uh, changes that we need to make. And, of course, it has to have interoperability and um, the technology integration. Use, generally, I think the trend is going for that we don't use satellite imagery as, as a standalone. Um, and it's usually combined with other, you know, um, emerging technologies like blockchain or IoT or a lot of the mobile sensing technologies. So it's really about the integration. And of course, machine learning and AI is is really much needed in in this field with uh, ground proof. And I think UNDP is a, in, a, in a good position to provide this ground proofing side so that we can um, we can actually provide some useful algorithms together. Yeah, I'll stop here, and Bertrand, back to you. Yeah, if we can go to the next slide. Oh. All right, we, we, on the, when the next slide will come back, you will see that we just wanted to give you an, an example of the partnership that we, that we have. Huh? First, uh, with UNOSA. And uh, thanks, uh, Simonetta, Marcus, uh, Juan Carlos and team. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. And we, we, we do not miss this, uh, this uh, high-level event. Uh, I think we didn't miss it since uh, 2016. We are very glad to, to be here and to work with you constantly. Uh, a special thanks also to the uh, uh, U.S. State Department, which has allowed us uh, recently to uh, to use for free uh, their library of uh, high-resolution images, and uh, and this uh, this uh, this permission has given a, has given a new boost to our use of uh, of uh, of satellite technologies. Just to give you an example of the request we received since last week, so in less than eight days. We have received more than 11, so from agriculture in Guatemala, for pollution in Yemen, plastic marine in Indonesia, monitoring of the Kakinada mangrove in India, uh, Info Segura in El Salvador, uh, agriculture in Myanmar, coastal monitoring in Fiji, environment in Indonesia, election organization in Libya, and uh, poverty analysis in Gambia. Voilà. So all that triggered by the ability for us to use uh, high resolution, uh, high resolution images. Voilà. We have also a, a, a UN Biodiversity Lab with NASA. We are very glad to be part of the Space Climate Observatory, and we really count on it to uh, to scale up all the analysis we do uh, on uh, the impact of climate change. Uh, we have also a, a partnership with DLR uh, that we use in Mozambique and uh, in other countries uh, uh, since 2018. Uh, we use Copernicus a lot. Thanks you, uh, Copernicus colleagues, if you are here and the European Union for funding Copernicus. Uh, it's a tremendous tool for us to uh, to manage the recovery uh, after disaster. And uh, of course, we, we partner a lot with uh, other UN agencies through the, the GGIM network, which is uh, internal to, to the UN. Voilà. Uh, and then, uh, as a, if we can go to the next slide, as uh, as Reina said, uh, the, the 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 next step for us is really to be able to scale up. We can tell you a, a lot of uh, nice stories. It's perfect before Christmas, but we are looking for to increase our impact. For uh, for example, the the 
the project we had, uh, we have uh, in Uganda is impacting four million people around the the west, the wetlands in uh, in 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 the center east of Uganda. But it could be 40 million very easily if we were able to apply the recipe we have here with a mix of satellite and local data to uh, to Vietnam, to Indonesia, to Honduras. So the the scale up capability we we have it. We have the local data everywhere. We just miss the uh, the, the data science and uh, the s satellite science to be able to have reliable models. Right? It's now a scientific issue. Uh, uh, for us, voilà. so and uh, one other example is we we've done a, 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 we've built a small tool to monitor coastal uh, coastal erosion in uh, in Liberia. We studied also the situation in uh, Saint Louis du Senegal, and we've tried it in Fiji. It's a disaster in Fiji. We don't have yet enough data, voilà. so we need to build this capability uh, to. to to, to use data models, to use algorithm, to scale up, uh, to scale up the, the, the analysis we are able to do in, in, in one country. So, uh, so we, we want to switch from uh, storytelling to, to industrials. Thank you, and uh, very happy to be here. Thank you, Reina, and th thank you, Petro, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, you did very well as a duo, I have to say. <laughs> um, I see that Annalisa is back. Uh, Annalisa, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry that you dropped out earlier. Um, so it was only your video that stopped, but after a while also your presentation. Um, maybe you would be able to to have a, a summary slide or something like, like that, that you could present to us shortly so that we don't miss uh, your presentation entirely. So indeed, I have been uh, talking with the colleagues uh, in uh, Vienna and they might support me with the sharing of the presentation. So I thank you very much for giving me the possibility to actually uh, finish the presentation. And I'm very sorry for these uh, technical issues that are I mean, uh, happening. I believe I was talking for a little while to myself and uh, it's uh, nice uh, to have the possibility to actually provide some of the concrete examples that are included in the presentation presentation because uh, uh, I believe that this is the most interesting part for, for the audience here today. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. So, I believe that this is the point where I stopped my presentation. And uh, again, just uh, to start back, I mean, this is... Um, this is a routing for plant health. So this is just uh, some of the concrete examples that you can find in the in the publication, and this is related to the European Union Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, which is uh, basically a comprehensive and very ambitious long-term plan to protect nature and to reverse the degradation of the ecosystems. So um, space data, also in this case, could be an invaluable asset, uh, especially for what concerns the early detection of plant stress. And uh, as you can read a little bit in the slide, the challenge of our flora is that um, uh, is not only deriving from the climate change, but also um, deriving from the increased, for instance, international trade from uh, globalization, which favors a very fast diffusion of exotic plant pests. So eventually, this can be a terrific danger for human health, for food security, and also for the degradation of the indigenous biodiversity. Um, uh, in this case, earth observation can be an irreplaceable asset, uh, allowing for periodic monitoring of a very large portion of our earth. And uh, thank thanks also to the repetitive flyover, this generates historical data, which are easy to compare, and it allows for a very cost effective identification and mapping of uh, plants and trees and to detect the stress uh, even uh, way earlier, a uh, naked human eye can see this. So. Here again, although I mean uh, there are like a certain certified benefits for the users of this uh, um, of uh, this data in the community of uh, uh, let's say phytosanitary research institution, earth observation is not used enough, and uh, this is why last year, for instance, together with Eufresco, which is the European Network for National Plant Protection Organization. Um, we 
worked on a policy brief. The policy brief has been uh, presented to the European Commission and, the, and it calls basically for a better introduction and integration of satellite big data as a complementary source of information to others that can be used by these also um, organizations to have like a better um, understanding uh, of uh, and better decision making processes also uh, on uh, plant uh, plant health. Uh, next slide please. So those are also other concrete examples of operational satellite based applications which are used uh, by different a different set of uh, users uh, that are currently benefiting from their from their use. Uh, I selected some of the domains, let's say, that can be of interest and that are the most affected also by climate change and human activities. Um, these being uh, our oceans. So I decided to take these also because, uh, I mean, in 2021, we started the ocean decades and uh, the, let's say, uh, preservation of the biodiversity at uh, in the ocean is uh, very important for, for everybody. And um, here you can see uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, SASEMAR is the Maritime Safety and Rescue Agency, is a Spanish public authority, which is working under the Spanish Ministry of Transport, Mobility and Urban Agenda. His mission is to ensure protection of life at sea, uh, including pollution prevention and response. Um, since uh, uh, the 2002 prestige oil spill accident, which happened in the Galicia region, uh, for local uh, Spanish authorities, the protection of the sea has become a priority. This because, uh, of course, for the protection of the biodiversity, but also for the economic activities which are linked to the to the sea and uh, which is coastal tourism, for instance, very important for the region as well, and also fishery. So, um, given that uh, it was very um, uh, an efficient deployment of the different resources uh, and the different units which would go and uh, and check the health of the sea. Uh, SASEMAR decided to integrate the information they had with uh, IBSAR. IBSAR is a solution relying on multiple data sets, which include satellite tracked surface drifter high frequency radar data, um, combined also with the ocean models provided by the Copernicus Marine Service, um, which gives also the possibility to have uh, drifting models uh, to understand where the spills, the oil spill in this case, or the different pollutants are basically moving. And uh, it's way easier right now for the different units to identify the pollutants, to basically uh, control their way and to make sure that these uh, do not affect uh, large, uh, let's say, um, areas. And the uh, EBSR is also provided with an integrated skill assessment service, which allows for the visualization, comparison, and evaluation of uh, model performance. Basically, SASEMAR, through the introduction of the EBSR, achieved its goal to increase the preparedness and the reaction in case of an emergency at sea. And um, now, by selecting the most accurate data, SASEMAR is able to optimize the response time to maritime emergencies. And um, also, it's able to do this in a way more effective way. Uh, now that they can benefit from a single access point to multiple data sets, uh, which is also provided in a very user friendly way through a dashboard, which is very easy to understand, and uh, the actionable information are providing also um, a benefit that can be uh, monetized. Uh, next slide, please. So another example that I wanted to bring today was about uh, forestry and the satellite applications that are currently used for forest management. So here, for example, uh, you have uh, um, Voivodinashume, which uh, I'm very sorry for the pronunciation for the people that are listening to us from Serbia. I know that I my pronunciation is very bad. Um, but uh, this is uh, um, basically a public company, a public entity, which is currently in charge for the management of the 65% of the region's forest and forest land. The company uh, ensures also compliance uh, to other local authorities with the wood harvesting quotas and the forest regeneration. So um, nowadays, due to an intensive farming and to the urban sprawl, 
uh, the forests of the regions are very fragmented in space. And in order to create an appropriate management plan uh, for the forest units, the company needs a, a, a different set of information from uh, cadaster to soil data to protecting species, for instance, archives to water management data uh, to infrastructure plan. However, they found that um, go to the relevant uh, public authorities and uh, to ask for the different information to make it together, um, they encountered a lot of red tape, which makes it very hard to obtain the information and also to uh, put it together in an understandable way. So um, the high resolution remote sensing data, which they purchase uh, uh, on an early basis through public pro procurement, give them the possibility to actually do that in a very cost effective way. So nowadays, only 10 to 15 field investigators are deployed with a um, dramatic decrease of the number of units and uh, on the money that have been uh, uh, applied by the company to actually manage the forest and they came up with maps and uh, of wood types for instance which uh, translated also in the evaluation of the forest grow and uh, in the compliance with the reporting uh, that they have to do um, with the authorities next slide please uh, so the very last uh, uh, application which I would like to present today is about uh, water management, fresh water management. I believe that, uh, I mean, water, I believe it's not me believing it, but I mean, water is one of the most important elements for human life on Earth. So the management of these resources is uh, very relevant. And here we have an example of uh, Morocco in the 10th uh, uh, hydraulic basin, which uh, is uh, being controlled by an agency that federates uh, stakeholders of an area of about 25,000 square, square kilometers, counting six administrative districts within, uh, within it. So um, the, uh, the agency is basically mandated to plan and to develop the water resources of the region and um, to ensure, of course, the sustainability. So since 1990s, a series of uh, droughts um, and the increasing number of groundwater pumping sites for irrigation purposes uh, caused a drop in the level of the Outs Aquifer, which is one of the biggest in the region, um, of up to uh, two meters per year, which is a lot. So. Um, the, one of the goal of the agency was to ensure a more efficient water use in the region, and they needed, uh, on one hand, to predict that the snow melting feeding the reservoir upstream, and on the other hand, they needed also to have a better understanding and overview of the water demand for agricultural purposes down downstream. They managed to do this thanks to a satellite-based uh, satellite uh, application, which is powered by Earth observation imagery. And um, since basically 2010, uh, the agency used uh, remote sensing in, indeed to estimate the availability uh, of, uh, of the water in uh, the snow reservoirs. And on the other end, the demand for irrigation purposes. Uh, so they managed uh, to adapt the groundwater uh, um, abstraction to such demand in order to minimize the waste. Next slide, please. Uh, I will conclude uh, by saying that uh, this is, it was just a very short uh, presentation of, on some of the applications that are currently supporting uh, climate change um, actors and uh, community for reporting reasons and also uh, to really like uh, have uh, concrete actions. Uh, however, everybody who is interested can go and visit our database, which is one, that, one of the largest European database of success stories and user cases, in order to better understand which were the needs uh, and the challenges of the, of the users. Uh, in this sense, I would like to stress the fact that uh, in order to have a wider uptake of satellite-based solution, it is needed to involve the user, to put them on the spotlight and at the center, and to start co-creating solutions together with them because there is no one of the shelf solution that can be applicable to all the, uh, all the users. So with this, uh, and with my last slide, I thank everybody for the attention and I thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity of concluding my presentation. And uh, I'm happy to actually interact with the, all of you. So you have my emails and my contact, uh, please write me. Bye-bye. Thank you, Annalisa. I'm happy that it worked out in the end and that you were able to present. Thank you very much.
uh, also for your flexibility in giving two parts of your presentation. Um, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers. I would also like to thank the very active audience. Um, you have been very effective. I can see that a Q&A session was already go going on in parallel in the chat. So I think a lot of questions have already been answered, but there are still some uh, more questions in the Slido app. Uh, and I think we have time for, for like two or three questions. Um, I would like to start with the most prominent question. Um, is it realistic to train users to use space data? Wouldn't the matchmaking between users and data experts who can actually work with the data make more sense? I think this is a very true and valuable uh, question. Is there anyone uh, in the board of speakers that would like to answer this uh, question? Uh, this is Juan Carlos Villagran. We often uh, bring experts from the space community uh, to train people in developing countries on the processing of satellite imagery and on the use of uh, services. Uh, because we, we understand and we see the value of taking advantage of access to satellite imagery as well as taking advantage of the services like the Copernicus Global Flood Awareness System or the Copernicus Global Drought Observatory. Uh, so one thing that we do recognize is uh, people in developing countries see the usefulness of these services, but they also want to generate information on their own. This is something that we have to keep in mind. We cannot just there are people here in developing countries who also study geography and systems engineers, and they would like to contribute to disaster management efforts. And that means they also want to generate useful information themselves. And that's where we see the benefit of training them on the processing of satellite imagery. So that they're not, not just the messengers between what a service is developed in Europe. Okay, so ev everything comes down to a, um, a specific training of, of potential users in the end, right? Yes, we, at least from the point of view of you, better. Indeed, yes, we, we uh, as part of our efforts, see the need to train the end users. Maybe I also would like to add something on, on this, uh, which is uh, exactly in the direction of what uh, Juan Carlo was saying. Uh, the, it depends on the actual uh, user. So sometimes uh, the training that you need to do is about the solution that has been developed. So it's really how to integrate uh, the data, the statistics, the indicators that are stemming from the solution into the workflow of the of the user. So how they can actually make this information actionable for actionable for their own purposes. At the time, the training that you can do or that you can provide and what, for instance, uh, we have been also doing, it's to put in, in contact the experts that can uh, uh, train people on the processing itself. So which uh, platform you can use, uh, how you can process that observation raw data into the, into the information that you need or how you can, for instance, use those data sets uh, with uh, digital uh, technology for instance, uh, um, solutions, how you can integrate them for a completely different solution itself. So there is different levels of training that you can provide to end users, and it really depends on the community that you're addressing. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Annalisa, for, for answering this question. Um, I think, yeah, it's uh, one minute before the closing of the session. So I would like to thank everyone uh, for your active um, participation, for your questions giving to the board of speakers. Thank you to the speakers for, for your excellent presentations. I think um, they were really interesting uh, for all of us. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope you have um, a great and interesting rest of the World Space Forum. Uh, the next session we are having is a matchmaking session, so maybe you will be meeting each other and, and discussing uh, questions further. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Susanna. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks a lot for joining. Thanks a lot for 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 joining in. As 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 we have heard, UNDP is a is since since um, a few years coming coming and sharing their expertise and knowledge with us during this um, during these sessions. Um, we have already heard it. We are going to move now in the matchmaking session. Just a few reminders on the matchmaking session, since we're getting a few questions around that. So you. Um, during the registration process, you were able to sign up or, or confirm that you're interested in the matchmaking. This, uh, uh, this indicated interest prompted us to send you a registration link through an external platform. In this external platform, you should have registered over the past two days. You could have um, activated your profile, um, written down where you're active in, what is your uh, topic of expertise, and also you, you um, can indicate through that profile uh, your availabilities. Thanks, and based on that, you can then reach out to other partners um, where your availability would join, uh, would would match, and you can request a, bi a bilateral meeting with these persons. You can in this in this entire setup and in in the program, you can write them a message about your interest, about your act, uh, about your action areas, and so on. So um, this was the starting point for actually getting you to the to the matchmaking. This was the the, the process which was used for. For you to engage directly with with the other participants. In the next step, you were you either received um, uh, meeting requests or you you posted meeting requests, and you either have accepted or declined it. Then you should have received um, automated um, links from from the from the system. It's it's sent and distributed automatically, which gives you and the person you you wish to meet a one on one. On one on one, a virtual link, and you can. It's a browser-based link where you can where you can meet the other person uh, directly. I really would like to um, remind everybody who has accepted these invitations to to go back uh, to your to your email inboxes and uh, and log in to the times you have accepted the meetings. Um, and uh, I really would like to to hear back from the from the from your experience how it works and how how successful this was. Um, it is an additional effort from our side, as I said a few times already, um, to provide you an additional platform outside of the of the knowledge sharing and information to connect really to other other panelists and participants of the World Space Forum because we feel that this hallway talks, this coffee talks, is one of these important elements at every conference, um, which unfortunately suffers under the virtual environment, and therefore we we are grateful to the to our hosts. And our, our our support here um, in in Austria through the Austrian uh, Chamber of uh, Economics that they have provided us with this link. Uh, it's a very easy to use tool. Um, I know it's something which is maybe not not used yet very commonly. So uh, I, I kindly ask for a bit of patience with the others to to get acquainted with the with the system. And I kindly invite everybody to follow through with your with your um, with your um, agenda. Uh, just a quick reminder from my side. One additional um, or two additional uh, other information. Thank you for everybody who has shared with us uh, posters and presentations and abstracts. These are now accessible through the UNUSA website. You just need to go to the conference website. You will have an access there to all the, the posters which we have received um, and all the abstracts which we have received. There's a book of abstract for those who Unfortunately, didn't have a chance to present at the World Space Forum, but we didn't we we didn't want to miss the opportunity to give you the uh, a, a chance to be presented. Um, and last but not least, um, we are now moving into the matchmaking session, but we'll come back at five o'clock Vienna time CET. So um, that's in in one and a half hours, so ninety minutes for matchmaking now, and then at five o'clock uh, um, Vienna time. We will uh, meet and resume again and go more into the substance of successful examples and initiatives where we hear firsthand from experts who are already using and applying space technology for climate action and the different areas which should be used as a as a uh, as a as a session where you can get your uh, motivation up and, and maybe reach out to others as well so uh, that's it i close it here now and i wish you an interesting and successful matchmaking session thank you very much